So good morning, my name is Neha Palmer. I head up energy uh, procurement and strategy for Google's global fleet of data centers. In 2016, we used six terawatt hours of electricity. That's more than my hometown of San Francisco used in the same year. So we're consuming a lot of energy. Back in 2012, we actually made a commitment to move towards 100% renewable energy for our operations. And I'm very proud to say, after a lot of hard work, we're set to reach that goal here in 2017. A lot of other corporations have made similar commitments to renewable energy. Uh, there's lots of uh, developers, lawyers, bankers, and others really working to help companies make this commitment. So in light of that, I'm here to ask the question today, is 100% renewable energy the silver bullet that will help us save the world from climate change? So why does energy matter to Google? Well, data center electricity is about 95% of the electricity we consume as a corporation. And electricity consumption is the largest portion of our carbon footprint. So if we're gonna run our business in an environmentally responsible manner, we really need to address this part of our emissions. The second piece is cost. Uh, data center energy is actually the largest operational expense for data centers. So controlling that is a very important component in running our business. Besides the data centers and the energy that we have uh, for them, we have a lot of other groups at Google focused on energy and energy management. Uh, we have Ness, which is in the home. We have Makani, which is a cutting edge wind technology. And we most recently announced Malta, which is an energy storage technology. So there's a lot of effort at Google around this, but the most, uh, I guess, operational focus is here on the energy proc procurement for our data centers. So here's a picture of one of our data centers in Pryor, Oklahoma, and I show you this for a couple of reasons. So the first, as you can see, is that it's a huge industrial operation. These are really quite large installations that we are, um, we are building today. Uh, the second thing that you can see is that it's a pretty massive construction site as well. And this is not uh, unique to Pryor. Uh, pretty much every single data center we have is under constant construction. So the six terawatt hours of electricity that we used in 2016 will expand significantly over the coming years. And as an industry, data center energy consumption is increasing. So it's very important for us as a company and as an industry to address electric consumption uh, and the emissions from that with renewable energy. So we have 15 primary data centers on four continents. And we care about energy like any large industrial user of energy does. So first of all, we care about cost. As I mentioned, it's the largest OPEX for our data centers. Second, we care about reliability. Uh, we run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, you can imagine how irritating it would be when you went to fire up your Gmail or look at maps and you didn't have access to the data. So these are, we consider these a uh, critical infrastructure. And the last is the environmental attributes of the energy that supplies our data centers. Uh, again, it's the biggest portion of our emissions, so for us to address that, we really need to think about where we're putting these data centers, and it's becoming a larger component of how we decide where we build new data centers. So back in 2012, we made a commitment to be 100% renewable for our operations. We started uh, in 2010 with our first 100 megawatt wind deal in Iowa. Uh, I arrived shortly after that, and since then, we've been able to do 19 more transactions for a total of 2.6 gigawatts of renewable energy contracts. That's 26 times our original commitment we made in 2010. Um, I'm proud to say I came from the utility industry, and we had one very large team focused on buying very similar amounts of renewable energy in one market. We've been able to do this at Google with a fairly lean team and many different markets across the world. And we've learned a lot along the way. Uh, how you buy renewable energy in uh, the northern European market is very different than how you do it in Chile. Uh, but we're proud to say that we're, uh, we're you know, reaching this 100% renewable goal. So how do we think about renewable energy and how we engage with the markets and what types of renewable energy we buy? So we have some pretty uh, stringent uh, procurement principles. The first is additionality. We want to make sure that the energy from the projects we buy is truly displacing brown power on the grid. And we do this by ensuring that these are new projects, Greenfield, that are truly displacing the brown power. By making a long-term commitment to buy the energy from these projects, these are 10 to 15 year transactions, 
we're providing the developer enough certainty to go ahead, finance the project, and build it. So our commitment is really what's enabling this power to come onto the grid. The second is physical energy. We want bundled energy in RECs, renewable energy credits. So we're not just buying the credits, we actually want the physical energy to be uh, generated and put onto the grid. And the last is proximity. We want to buy renewable energy in the grids that we're actually operating our data centers. By doing this, we're reducing the carbon intensity of the grids that we're actually drawing power from. There's actually another really big reason why we do this, and that is because it makes good business sense. So I started uh, working on renewables about 10 years ago, and the first solar deals that I was signing were well above $200 a megawatt hour. That's really expensive power. I've seen offers in the last couple of years now for under $30 a megawatt hour for solar. That is an astounding decrease in the last 10 years alone. In addition to the decrease in uh, the price of renewable energy, there's another attribute that's really attractive for businesses as well. As I mentioned, these are 10 to 15 year contracts for a fixed price. That fixed price, which has no exposure to fuel prices and uh, basically has no volatility. So we're able to have certainty in our business expenses for the long term. That's really helpful for planning and running a very large scale business. So I'm proud to say, as a result of these 20 transactions and all of this effort, Google is the largest corporate purchaser of renewable energy in the world. We buy more than many utilities do every year. Uh, what I'm actually more proud about is that we've had lots of companies join us along the way. So you'll see some familiar names here, my tech cohort from California. But there's actually a lot of interesting uh, things going on in this chart. You see companies like Dow, you see companies like Procter & Gamble also engaging in renewable energy because they see the business sense that it makes along with environmental attributes it provides. So this is becoming a global phenomenon over time. So what do we mean by 100% renewable? So for Google, it means that on an annual basis, for every megawatt hour of electricity we consume, we're gonna buy an equivalent physical megawatt hour of renewable energy. Now, you know, that's just the beginning. We, because we don't have choice in every single market of our type of energy supply, in some markets, we're not buying quite as much as we consume. And in other markets, we're buying more than we consume. We know that to actually have the maximum impact on carbon, we need to exactly match how much we buy from renewable energy with how much we're consuming. So this 100% renewable energy goal, it really is just the beginning towards a more matched uh, consumption profile. There's also the question of inter intermittency. So this is a um, graph of the UK power grid uh, over a 24 hour period. And you can see the different colors uh, of the bars are basically different types of resources flexing up and down as demand increases and decreases throughout the day. The top bar blue is natural gas. Uh, you also see the white line there, which is the carbon intensity of the grid at any given moment during the day. And you see that as demand increases, that carbon intensity increases throughout the day. So this makes me ask uh, myself questions about my, my portfolio of contracts and how I consume energy. Data centers are pretty flat, almost totally flat on a 24 hour basis throughout the day. So I'm consuming on a flat basis. But my, wind, my, profile, my portfolio is actually quite heavy on wind. We're about 95% wind contracts. So am I, and, and wind tends to blow at night, so that's when it's producing. So am I putting renewable energy on the grid at the nighttime when the carbon intensity is low, so offsetting low carbon intense hours? And am I consuming throughout the day when carbon intensity is high? So to truly, again, make the maximum impact, you'd want to match the production of the renewable energy with your consumption. There's also a question of whether or not we can actually get to a zero carbon grid. Uh, on one side, you have people who are saying that you can get there with uh, wind, solar, hydro, and a little bit of storage alone in a very cost-effective manner. On the other side, you have uh, experts arguing that you need a much broader base of energy resources and a significant com component of demand response to get there. All of this speaks to what companies really truly want, which is a clean, zero carbon energy source 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Renewable energy is really just the beginning, and 100% renewable energy is just the beginning. The true goal is to get to a zero carbon grid for everybody. And we'll be working towards that goal 
over the coming years. So there's kind of three pillars how we think we're going to get there. The first is policy. We'd like to see policies that help promote the uptake of renewable energy. That could be anything from a carbon tax to the rules on how you actually dispatch power onto the grid. The second is technology. We need tools to optimize both supply and demand. Uh, storage is what comes to mind for most folks. Um, people think that's going to be the thing that solves this intermittency problem. But even by increasing the efficiency of existing technologies like wind, we're able to bring more renewable energy onto the grid in a cost-effective manner. And the last is commercial innovation. Can we do things like sign contracts for wind and solar simultaneously that will create a more flat profile of renewable energy that matches our consumption? So all of this brings me back to the original question. Is 100% renewable energy and this corporate commitment to 100% renewable energy the silver bullet that's going to save us from climate change? Well, climate change is a very complex problem. And the policy, the technical innovation will take a while for us to get to a zero carbon grid. But in the meantime, this commitment to 100% renewable energy is a great start and a cornerstone of getting there. Now, corporate commitments are, uh, have already decreased emissions on the grid significantly. We've had eight gigawatts of corporate commitments to date. And based on current commitments, it looks like there'll be another 60 gigawatts of renewable energy added to the grid based on corporate commitments alone. This paired with other uh, non-compliance um, uh, commitments in the US would actually get us halfway to the commitments that we laid out in the Paris agreements alone. So you were able to actually have a significant impact without any additional governmental mandates. The jury is still out on whether or not we can get to a 100% carbon-free grid. But in the meantime, the corporate commitment to renewable energy is pushing the industry forward, creating significant reduction in emissions. And, act and private actors are acting where the government will not. 100% renewable energy is a key cornerstone of getting to a uh, true carbon-free grid. Thank you. <laughs>